Hi, it's Miss Melissa with the Oosterhout Free Library and a special election edition of Book Bites. Our books and videos today are about one of the most exciting and important things about America, voting. More than 200 years ago, the United States became one of the first countries in the world where the people pick our leaders. There's still places in the world where that's not true. In this year's presidential election, voting by mail is already underway. And it all wraps up on November 3rd when people can vote in person. If I Ran for President by Catherine Steyer. If I ran for the presidency of the United States, I'd hope the people of the United States would choose me for a very important job, lead the job of leading our country. I'd hope I'd follow in the footsteps of our great presidents, like George Washington, our first president, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. You can see their pictures there on the sculpture of Mount Rushmore. I'd have to think carefully about my decision to run for president. I'd want to know what my family thought about it, too. Then I'd ask myself, am I the best person for the job? Am I ready for the very, very hard for our country? Do lots of people believe in me and think I would be right for the office? If I could answer yes to all those questions, then I'd declare my candidacy. That means I'd announce I was interested in the job of the presidency of the United States. If I ran for president, I'd run a campaign for the voters to learn all about me. People who thought I'd be a good president would donate money or time to help. I'd hire people to work for my campaign too. Campaigns can make a candidate famous. Soon my name or face would appear on signs, buttons, bumper stickers, and t-shirts. I'd even be in television commercials. If I ran for president, I'd work with my political party. That's a group of people who share the same beliefs about how the country should be governed. They support candidates who uphold those ideas. The two major parties are the Democratic Party, their symbol's a donkey, and the Republican Party, their symbol's an elephant. There are other parties too called third parties, but people besides me would want to be president. The Republican and Democratic parties must choose whom will support in the election. In some states, like Iowa, the parties each hold meetings called caucuses, where members pick their favorite candidate. In most states, party members hold an election called a primary. Caucuses and primaries show which candidates are popular with the voters and who might have the best chance of being elected president. The first primary is held in New Hampshire in the winter before the presidential election. I'd be sure to visit there, but I'd have to bundle up. The summer before the election, the political parties announced their candidates for president. The major parties make this announcement at meetings called conventions. Each state sends delegates to the convention. Delegates vote for the candidates who is most popular in their state. The convention looks like a big celebration full of cheering and chanting and balloons and confetti. Millions of Americans watch the excitement on TV. By the time of the convention, everyone usually knows which candidate will be chosen, but the delegates still hold a vote. If my party chose me to run for president, I'd make a speech to get everyone excited about helping me win. I'd tell the American people about my platform. That's my plans and ideas for our country. My running mate would make a speech too. That's the person who'd be my vice president if I became president.
If I ran for president, I'd be invited to debate with other, other presidential candidates. A person called a moderator would ask us questions. See, so that's the moderator. People across the country would listen carefully to our answers. Reporters would ask me questions about my life, my family, even my cat, Sassy. They'd print old photographs of me in newspapers and magazines, like the snapshot of me in my superhero costume or my baby picture when I still wore diapers. If I ran for president, I would travel the country to meet people. I'd have my own campaign bus or airplane to take me from place to place. Inside, there'd be comfy seats, perfect for checking out the news, writing speeches, and thinking about how to solve the nation's problems. I'd take naps, too. Candidates need lots of rest. I'd work hard and I'd be very busy. One week, I might sit, share cereal with kindergartners in California, crunch corn with farmers in Kansas, have dinner in Delaware, where I'd order the Blue Plate Special with apple pie and a large strawberry milkshake. After all that food, I might not feel too well. Still, I'd have to smile and talk with the people I met. Presidential candidates make lots of speeches, shake hands and cuddle babies. Well, we don't shake hands these days, right? Finally, in November, election day would arrive. If I ran for president, I'd be nervous and excited. On election day, millions of voters from across the country go to their polling places to cast their ballots. That's another way of saying they, they go someplace to vote. This year in Pennsylvania, we're already voting by mail also. In our country, people vote in private. No one but you knows who you voted for. But I choose my favorite candidate, me. That's very important that our vote is secret. Once the voting is finished, officials count out the ballots. Then comes the announcement on television, radio, in the newspapers, and on the internet. People everywhere find out who will be the next president of the United States. I'd stay up late and keep my fingers crossed. If I ran for president and lost, I'd be disappointed. The people I worked with would be disappointed too. Still, I'd be proud that I had taken part in a free and fair election. I'd make a telephone call to offer my best wishes and my support to the winner, our next president. But if I won, wow. On January 20th, I'd say the words of the oath of office. On that day, called Inauguration Day, there'd be a parade and a fancy ball. Then I'd move into the White House in Washington, D.C. to begin my four years as President of the United States of America. And what would I, what would I do when I became President? Well, that's another story. This book is called Grace for President, and it's by Kelly DiPuccio, and it is published by Disney Hyperion. And it's a fun story, and it also goes into detail about something called the Electoral College, which is very important, but a lot of people don't know about it. So at the end of this, you might understand it better than some adults. So we start with some pictures of our best known presidents. I see Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and then beneath him, somebody who maybe could be president for some day, our main character, Grace.
One Monday morning in September, Mrs. Barrington rolled out a big poster with all the president's pictures on it. Grace Campbell could not believe her eyes. Where are all the girls? That is a very good question, said Mrs. Barrington. The truth is our country has never had a woman president yet, yet. No girl president ever, Grace asked. No, I'm afraid not, said Mrs. Barrington. Grace sat at her desk and stewed. No girls? Who never heard of such a crazy thing? Finally, she raised her hand. Yes, Grace? I've been thinking it over and I'd like to be president. Several students in the class laughed. Well, I think that's a star spangled idea, Grace, said Mrs. Barrington. In fact, we can have our own election right here at Woodrow Wilson Elementary. Woodrow Wilson was a president. The snickering in the room stopped. Grace smiled. Would anyone else like to run for president? Mrs. Barrington asked the class. Nobody raised their hand. Coming president was going to be easy, Grace thought. The next day, Mrs. Barrington made an announcement. In the name of democracy, I've invited Mr. Waller's class to join us. Their class has nominated Thomas Cobb to be their presidential candidate. Grace's heart sank. Thomas was the school spelling bee champion. His experiments always took a blue ribbon at the science fair, and he was captain of the soccer team. Becoming president wasn't going to be so easy after all, Grace thought. The teachers put the name of all 50 states and the District of Columbia in a hat. Everyone except for Grace and Thomas got to pick a state. I'm Texas, said Anthony. I'm New Hampshire, said Rose. I'm Michigan, said Robbie. What does the number 16 mean? Each state is assigned a number of electoral votes. That number is determined by how many people live in that state, said Mrs. Barrington. Each of you will be a representative of your state. Altogether, our country has 538 electoral votes, Mrs. Mr. Waller explained. On election day, the candidate who receives 270 electoral votes or more wins the election. Now, let's see if you can figure this out before the kids. Why 270, Grace asked. What do you think? That's more than half the electoral votes, Mr. Waller said. Becoming president really wasn't going to be easy, Grace thought. Grace came up, came up with a campaign plan. Make history, vote Grace Campbell for president. Thomas came up with his own campaign slogan. Vote for Thomas Cobb, the best man for the job. Grace listened to what issues were important to the students, and she made a list of campaign promises. A peaceful school, no bullies. A cleaner school, no littering. Better hot lunches, no more fish stick tacos. Thomas made his own list of promises. Free tutoring, free soccer lessons, fish stick tacos every week. Grace made campaign buttons and posters. So did Thomas. You've probably seen those around, right? Each week, the teachers set aside time for the candidates to meet their constituents. Polls were taken. Voters were making their choices. So I see Grace is the one, vote for Grace. The man for the job is Thomas Cobb. So that, that's a good one because it rhymes. 
Grace continued to campaign. At recess, she gave speeches. After school, she held rallies. Meanwhile, Thomas wasn't worried. He had cleverly calculated that the boys held slightly more electoral votes than the girls. At recess, Tom, Thomas studied his spelling words. During lunch, he worked on his science experiments. After school, he played soccer. Even before the election, Grace made good on her promises. She joined the safety squad. She organized a school beautification committee and she volunteered her time in the school cafeteria. In early November, Woodrow Wilson Elementary hosted a special election, election day assembly Grace and Thomas took their places on stage as the school band played. Now see those speech bubbles? They're, t they're shaped like these states that each kid is talking about. Henry was the first representative to approach the microphone. The Yellowhammer State of Alabama casts its nine votes for Thomas Cobb. The last frontier state of Alaska casts its three electoral votes for the best man for the job, Thomas Cobb. Now these funny nicknames have to do with something about the state's history or geography, sometimes it's symbols. So uh, Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State because of sort of the, the shape of Pennsylvania and where it fits into the map. The Grand Canyon state of Arizona casts its 11 electoral votes for Grace Campbell. And so it went. State after state cast their votes. The scoreboard in the gymnasium kept track of the totals. The voting demonstration was quickly coming to an end. Clara approached the podium. The Badger State of Wisconsin cast its 10 votes for my best friend, Grace Campbell. And then look at where we are. Grace looked at the scoreboard. Thomas had 268 electoral votes. She had 267. There was only one state still accounted for. Wyoming. Thomas grinned. Grace felt sick. Sam walked up to the microphone. He looked at Thomas. He looked at Grace. He looked down at Grace's handmade flag. Sam didn't say a word. What are you waiting for? Thomas whispered. The band stopped playing. All eyes were on Wyoming. Finally, Sam cleared his throat. The Equality State of Wyoming cast its Three electoral votes for Grace Campbell. The gymnasium erupted in loud cheers and a few boos. Mrs. Barrington approached the podium with 270 electoral votes. The winner is Grace Campbell. Thomas looked stunned. Grace hugged Sam. Why did you do it? She asked. Sam handed Grace his flag because, he said, I thought you were the best person for the job. Now, that nickname for Wyoming, the Equality State, is because it's one of the first places where women won the right to vote. The following week, students in Mrs. Barrington's class worked on their career day presentations. Grace volunteered to go first. She stood at the front of the room and glanced at the poster still on the wall. 
My name is Grace Campbell, and when I grow up, I'm going to be President of the United States. This time, everyone believed that she would. So, here's a grown-up Grace being sworn in. This is how the ceremony takes place. It's in January, and they're standing in front of the U.S. Capitol, and the person in the black robe is a Supreme Court Justice. That's who administers the oath of office. So now that we've talked about the electoral votes, you might be wondering, what about the individual votes that each person casts? Well, because this, the number of electoral votes each state has is based on how many people live in a state, the two of them are supposed to basically line up they don't always. So we're hoping that someday, just like Grace for president, one of you might run for president someday.